resurrection of Jesus was in fact the first of the first fruits, and the resurrection of Christ coincided with the feast of the first fruits, the first of three Jewish harvest festivals. First the spring harvest, the barley one that is called the first fruits, then the summer harvest which occurs at Pentecost is considered the main harvest which primarily consists of wheat, and finally in the fall tabernacle harvest which mainly is concerned with grapes and other fruits. And here 1 Corinthians 15:20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and he has become the first fruits who have fallen asleep. And we'll continue on with this scripture which we've looked at before, verses 23 and 24, but now it begins to make more sense. And all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in turn, Christ, comma, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, then again as an after the end will come. Now also notice here Matthew 27, 52 and 53. These verses coincide with the crucifixion story at the exact moment of Christ's death upon the cross. Tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now these scripture passages of people being resurrected at the death of Christ is undisputed. There were far too many witnesses to deny it. Notice the scripture states that these were faithful people who were raised from the dead at the moment of Christ's death, but they did not show themselves until Christ rose from the grave. The reason being is this. During the celebration of first fruits, the priests would go into the field, into the harvest fields, and they would select an area that was most ripe. Then the people would cut a small sample, take it to the temple, and they would wave this small sample of grain before the throne of God in each thanksgiving and celebration. The point is that about this time, those who were raised at the crucifixion of Christ and then showed themselves at the resurrection of Christ, they were seen no more. That being when Jesus ascended to the Father, he took those with him. Today we have writings dating clear back to the first century, roughly 70 A.D., while several of the apostles were still alive, and they were preaching the fact that bodies were raised from the dead at the moment of Christ's crucifixion, and this preaching was never rebuted. And we continue on here showing that the pre-tribulation rapture is the promise to the church to be spared to tribulation. It is the first fruit, the barley harvest. And the style of harvest actually coincides with this. It is winnowed. When the Jewish people winnowed their barley crops, they did this in the evening because the evening winds picked up. How it was done is like this. They went to a hilltop, took their tools, and tossed the barley into the air. The chaff flew away and the grain fell back to the ground. That's how it was separated. Notice the analogy here that the wind carried away. And if you don't know, in Hebrew, the word wind and spirit, as in Holy Spirit, are one and the same. And to us, what is going to be carried away, the completion of the first fruits, is the church, the body of Christ, anyone who believes in Jesus at this time. Now, if you don't know, Jesus himself and his apostles always compared the church to the word bride, as in the bride of Christ. This was done so the believers would understand the correlation of the church in the rapture compared to the Jewish wedding traditions. A Jewish wedding consisted of the custom of betrothal. This was actually more advanced than an engagement. Legal binding contracts were actually signed at this time. Just as once we are saved and we accept Christ, we are betrothed to him. We are legally bound to him at that time. This chart demonstrates well the Jewish wedding tradition. The groom would leave his father's house, travel to his bride's desired home, and pay a great price for her. And in the case of the Christian, Jesus died upon the cross. Then the bride would either accept or reject the offer, either will become saved or we reject Christ. If the groom's offer was accepted, the contract was drew up. And the couple were already legally bound together, just as when we become saved, again, we are already legally bound to the Savior. Then, according to the customs of that time, the groom returned home to prepare a place for his future bride. The Father, Holy God in case of the church, would send the groom 
Jesus in our case, back to retrieve his bride when everything was prepared. The bride herself had no idea when the groom was going to return and lived in anticipation of this event. The bride was then taken back to her new home, and now listen to this. They entered the wedding chamber for seven days. And of course we know by Daniel and Revelation that the tribulation, great tribulation, will be a total of seven years. And from this the bride of Christ, the church, will be spared. Now let's take a look at John 14, 6 with the Jewish wedding tradition and the rapture in mind. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now the first rapture concludes the church age, otherwise known as the age of grace. While the second harvest coincides with the second rapture, the second harvest was actually considered to be the main harvest by the Jewish people. And interestingly enough, Revelation clearly states that those doing the preaching, those giving out the word of the kingdom of God, will in fact be Jewish pastors. At this time, because all the true believers in the church have already been raptured, and we'll get into that in just a few minutes. Now notice the third word down on the mid-tribulation list here called tribulum. That was a device drugged by an animal, a large heavy device embedded with stones to crush the wheat. The wheat has a hard shell. Unlike the first fruit barley, which is winnowed, tossed in the air in the wind, the spirit carries it away. The wheat has to be crushed by a tribulum, and that is exactly where the word tribulation comes from, is from this device. The ironic thing is that the people at this point who are saved have to endure the tribulation to this midpoint. They have to be crushed. They are hard-shelled, hard-headed people. Now at this point I'd really like to offer a warning because some out there might be thinking that they will wait to accept Jesus to believe all this until after the rapture occurs. And if that happens then they'll just wait on this second chance here in the mid-trib. What I would like to caution people about is there is an exact explicit warning in the scriptures on this very topic. Now I'm reading from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 beginning at verse 6. And now you know what is holding him back, that is Satan and his Antichrist, so that he may be revealed at the proper time, for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way, that is the Holy Spirit, that is the church primarily. The church is the believers, the body of Christ, and they are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And the church around the world works every day to restrain evil in many ways that we cannot even begin to comprehend. Now picking up here at verse 8, and then the lawless one will be revealed. The lawless one is the Antichrist, and he will be revealed after the rapture, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. That is the second coming at the conclusion of the Great Tribulation at the end of the seven years. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power, through signs and wonders that serve the lie. He will use supernatural powers of Satan, and the lie is Antichrist claiming that he is God. And all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing, they, the unsafe people of the earth, perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. They refuse to accept Christ. Now here it is. And for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. And here verse 12 sums it up. And so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, even though they knew they should, but have delighted in wickedness. They didn't want to give up their evil ways until it was proven in their sight that they needed to. However, in God's sight, they have clearly made their choice. They chose evil over good. They chose darkness over light. They chose Satan over him. Now here is the biblical reference to the Jewish pastors we spoke about earlier. The need being that all the pastors, the believing pastors of the world have been raptured, 
so God fulfills the purpose of Israel. Israel was always intended to spread his word, his light to the world. So he calls a total of 144,000 pastors, Jewish pastors, 12,000 from each tribe. And for those who know such things, the tribe of Manasseh was actually the eldest son of Joseph. One of the brothers, Dan, is omitted here. We will get into all that later, but the speculation is the false prophet, the Antichrist's right hand, will be Jewish and of the tribe of Dan. So that's why none of the descendants of Dan will be used as pastors at this time. However, scriptures do record at the return of the Messiah, the second coming of Christ. Dan is restored and his inheritance is allotted him. And picking up in verse 9 is the result of the 144,000 Jewish pastors. They are equal to 144,000 Mother Teresa's or Billy Graham's. After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one can number. What we can take note of here is that in other parts of Revelation, John is a witness to armies, end time armies and battles, and he is able to number them at 200 million, and this number here far exceeds that. That means there is clearly hope in the end times after the rapture and the rise of the Antichrist, that these Jewish pastors and this great multitude unnumberable means there will be the largest revival to holy God through Jesus that the world has ever seen. Now we'll skip down to verse 13 here, when the angel speaking to John asked him, Who are these people? And John said, Did you know who they are? And the angel explained, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They are the ones raptured mid-trib. That being, before the great tribulation kicks in, there's no need for the believers to go through the great tribulation. That's for the unbelievers. And here we skip up to Revelation 14, that shows the disposition of the 144,000, their reward. They're on Mount Zion in heaven before the Lamb, before Christ. Now some will say that this is on earth. No, this is in heaven because a few verses down here it just says that they are before the throne of God and the four living creatures and the elders are also there. That is clearly in heaven. The 144,000 and the multitude have clearly been raptured at this point. Also take notice here near the bottom that it was explained to John that the 144,000 pastors were the first fruits of the main harvest, just as Christ was the first fruit of the first harvest. Now we have reached the final rapture resurrection. This correlates with what is known as the gleanings, the leftovers of the two previous harvests. In Israel, in Jewish custom, this corresponds with the fruit harvest, mainly grapes, and this leads us to a very famous passage in Revelation, the grapes of wrath. And here we have a few verses explaining the harvest and the gleanings. When you, Israel, reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field, or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. And the second one down reads very close. Now when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest nor shall you glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather the fallen fruit of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the needy and for the stranger. And here in our third example, it's in triplicate. When thou cuttest down thine harvest of thy field, leave it for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. When thou beatest the olive tree, do not go over it again. Leave it for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And when you gather the grapes of the vineyard, do not glean after it. Leave it for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. Because... God is reminding them that they were once bondsmen, they were once slaves in Egypt, and that he is God and he is ordering this. Now notice that these gleanings are left for the poor, for the needy, and in this case it's for the poor in spirit. That meaning that these people are not believers, they were not raptured with the church, and they were not saved after the first rapture and taken in the main wheat harvest. These are people who became saved later after the first two raptures that they had not yet showed the fortitude to accept Christ. But when push come to shove, when they had to make their choice between the mark of the beast and accepting Jesus, they did accept Jesus, and in most cases they were martyred. They come late to the party, the party of salvation, so to speak, but it's better to come late not at all and to face eternity without Christ, without God. And now I'm reading from Revelation 14, and this is a long time before the second coming of Christ. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like the Son of Man. The Son of Man is a title that Jesus used to describe himself, and Daniel also mentioned this in End Times Prophecy. 
In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, he approached God, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, Jesus, glory and sovereign power. All nation and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion, Jesus, is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And to further our understanding what John is saying in Revelation when he refers to Jesus as the Son of Man, as explained by Daniel, is this explanation I found online. In a nutshell, Son of God implies his deity, Jesus, and Son of Man implies his humanity. Jesus Christ is fully human and fully God. In fact, the title for Jesus being Son of Man, for being human, appears 81 times in the Gospels. It appears that Jesus really wanted to stress the fact that he truly was deity, born into human flesh, that he could understand our problems, our struggles, and our trials firsthand. Now getting back to the grapes of wrath in Revelation. Seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, that is Christ, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel come out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, called to Jesus. What John is saying here is that he witnessed an angel coming out of the temple, out of the presence of God, and made a loud announcement to Christ sitting on the cloud. Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he, who was seated on the cloud, swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. That is Christ, and that is the rapture, the second rapture. And of all the raptures, we have scriptural points of reference for each of the events, and we will get into those in just a moment. And John in Revelation continues, Another angel come out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And still another angel who had charge of the fire. Fire always represents judgment and prophecy came to the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. He's speaking to the angel now. Jesus has already reaped and harvested. Reaping and harvest is a good thing. However, this time it's different. Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. That clearly is not a good thing. It's saying that these people who are surviving after the rapture are going to face God's wrath. They were trampled in the wine press outside the city, that is Jerusalem, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as a horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. What we're talking about here is another holocaust after the second Jewish rapture. God's wrath is going to be outpoured on Israel those who have made the treaty with the Antichrist and have accepted him as God. God's primary focus here is Israel, but also anyone else on earth who accepts the mark of the beast and accepts the Antichrist. But here take note that 1600 stadia is about 180 miles or 300 kilometers. And the amazing thing is, converting that over to modern measurements, it works out to 183.93 miles, roughly the length of modern-day Israel. So the scripture is saying that Israel is going to be harvested from one end of the land to the other. Israel is handled in two different ways. One, raptured, resurrected by Christ and a good reaping harvest, or crushed like the grapes of wrath of God. This third rapture resurrection occurs when Christ returns in what is known as his second coming or second advent. At this point, those who died after the two raptures and before his return their bodies are raised. See, they're only in heaven in their spiritual form. Their bodies are raised and are now made into a glorified body. And this completes the three rapture harvests.